do you know how much I've actually, uh, how much capital I've invested in Bitcoin at this point, Raul? No. Three billion three hundred thirty-five million dollars. That's pretty okay, spectacular. Okay, so that one person. Yeah. But I didn't have three billion three hundred thirty-five million dollars in my piggy bank when we last spoke. Yeah. Now, what happens if more than one person does this, Raul? <laughs> How many people does it take, right? And the answer is you need public entities and they need to be credit worthy and they need to be able to file a registration statement. You know, if you can file a registration statement, you can tap the fixed income markets. You can tap the convertible debt markets. You can tap the, the equity markets. And, um, and as you do that, that capital becomes permanent capital. Right, because uh, by the way, there there are some companies that can't own uh, digital property. They can't own the underlying property that is Bitcoin. Like if I if I have ten billion dollars in a um, in a fixed income fund, it took me thirty years to establish my relationships with my limited partners. I've got a charter. I have a charge. I can go and buy fixed income right now. My fixed income instruments are yielding two percent or two and a half or three percent. Or I can buy MicroStrategy yielding 6%. It looks like a pretty fat coupon to me. Well, we had, you know, we had lots of firms that gave us $50 million orders after one conference call, Ralph. <laughs> I, you know, we did that entire deal in one day. One day, no one-on-ones. One conference call, 130 firms on the phone. Okay, I'll give you a $50 million order. I'll give you a $25 million order. I'll give you a $100 million order. And um, why do they do that? Well, I mean, you get the Moody's credit rating. You get the S&P credit rating. You're a public company. You package a security, right, a, a derivative of, of a crypto asset called Bitcoin. It's a Bitcoin bond. And you put it out there and, and they can buy that thing. So what, we're, what we've seen over the past 12 months is we've seen the creation of public securities. A lot of people can buy you know, $500 million worth of marathon stock or $100 million worth of a Bitcoin mining stock, but they can't buy the Bitcoin. Yeah. They can buy the convert. They can buy the equity. They can buy the junk debt. They can, but they can't buy the Bitcoin. And of course, people in the crypto industry, the crypto traders, they don't understand why, right? Like, there's still a group of people that think, oh, well, you need to buy it and, and put it in cold storage and keep your keys, which is it, it's it's, uh, you know, what would, what would I call it? An ideologically pure approach to the industry, which works for a subset of people. But when I'm talking to a guy that runs a two billion dollar portfolio, if he went to his boss and said, I want to buy $25 million worth of, of Bitcoin and hold my private keys, he would get, you know, la <laughs> between laughed and fired, right? Like, that's not happening in a thousand years, no matter how hard. On the other hand, the guy can go like, okay, so yeah, this is good. So what was the interest rate again? 6%? Okay, I'll take 25 million of that. Next. He's got another deal to do the next day. So I think that what we're seeing is the maturing of the industry, the maturing of the asset class. When JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley start, started offering uh, Bitcoin funds like the NIDIG back funds and the Galaxy back funds, that was a big uh, endorsement, a big step forward. And I think we got what Wells Fargo, we've got Morgan Stanley, we've got JP Morgan. They've all moved to offer those funds. That was a big deal. And then I think that when the ETF comes, you know, right now we've got ETFs in Canada, right? I don't know if you saw Fidelity just went before the SEC. This is Fidelity. This is Fidelity for the last 60 years. They have like $10 trillion of assets under management. And there are companies that have been doing business with them for 50 years or 30 years. Fidelity goes in front of the SEC and they give a 20 page presentation on why Bitcoin is mature and why it's time to approve a Bitcoin ETP in the United States. And there's, you know, there's a lot of institutions that they will take $10 million chunks and $50 million chunks of this stuff once there is an ETP of sorts and uh, roll the clock back 18 months. 
none of this. You know, to be clear, I think there are two structural catalysts that will drive an acceleration of the industry and of, of Bitcoin in particular. One will be uh, the, the availability of broad-based ETPs in the U.S. capital markets. Yeah. That will be a big one. And we're watching that right now. It's a process. The second will be the normalization of, uh, of accounting for Bitcoin as a financial asset. Right now, Bitcoin is uh, an indefinite and tangible asset. Um, when, uh, when we roll the clock back 24 months, you couldn't find a publicly traded company that had $2 million of this stuff on their balance sheet. So if you're a bunch of accountants sitting around analyzing it, you would say there's, there's no compelling need, right, to normalize this. That No one's got $100 million of this stuff, right? There's $100 trillion of, of credit instruments and there's $2 million of Bitcoin. So I don't think we're going to focus on this. And I understand that. But indefinite and tangible accounting treatment says you ha you can mark it down and you and you have to mark it down to the lowest bid you can find on on the exchange at any minute of the day since the beginning of when you own the asset and you can never mark it up again. So that, that's a negative, right? It's a one way ratchet function, but it's wor it's worse than a one way ratchet function. It's like I bought a collection of baseball cards for a million bucks and I have to go to everybody I see at a party for the rest of my life and ask them if they'll buy my baseball card collection for a number. And if they tell me they'll give me a thousand dollars, I have to mark the baseball card collection down from a million dollars to a thousand dollars. Ludicrous. And if someone else, if Bill Gates offers me a billion dollars for the baseball card collection, I'm still carrying it on my books as a thousand dollars. So it's it's prejudicial, hostile, you know, accounting treatment. And um that, of course, is suboptimal. But there's another suboptimal thing about it, which is when you do mark it down, you have to run it through your P&L as an operating loss. It's not even a below the line. Uh, you know, it's a non-cash, you know, it's a non-cash investment cost in theory, but not per indefinite and intangible. Per indefinite and intangible if Facebook buys 50 billion of Bitcoin and it trades down 10% and then it trades up 100%, instead of holding $100 billion of assets, they're showing 40. And then in the next you know, quarter, they have a $10 billion operating loss against their $10 billion you know, gain. So they make no money in the year, even though they made $50 billion in the year. Okay, so what does that mean? Well. Look, if you're a pure play like MicroStrategy and your investors understand uh, we have 114,000 Bitcoin, you ignore all the rest. You multiply 114,000 by 47,000 and change. You're like, oh, they have five and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. OK, and if it doubles, they'll have 11 billion. And you divide the number of shares into that and you come to a conclusion about what you think the company's worth. OK, that's that's one approach. But if you're running Apple Computer or Facebook or Google and you've got a pristine P&L and you've got a pristine balance sheet and if you're a conventional CFO, you would think, well, like I have, I have a perfect P&L and a perfect balance sheet. And if I put this on the balance sheet, it's going to obscure the P&L and I'm to create pro formas and it's going to obscure the balance sheet. And now it's another set of pro formas. And now I'm going to go from telling everyone that I made 37 billion last year with 120 billion in assets to something hyper complicated that takes a half an hour to parse. And most of them are conventional, traditional investors. They don't want to spend the time on it. So the Warren Buffett's of the world, by the way, like he's totally fine owning Apple stock and Coke stock on his P&L, but he marks it to market every quarter.